Let us rise and worship the triune God. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And also to you. Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Lift up your hearts. Father God, mankind has warred and conspired and feuded for power, might, and dominion. But you, by your great power, have raised up our Lord Jesus from the dead and set him at your right hand. And all the kings and their kingdoms must bend their knees and loose their tongues to confess that Jesus Christ is king of it all. We now, as your people, rejoice to take our crowns and cast them at your feet. Our little kingdoms, our little households, our little town is yours. You are our king, and all we have and all we possess we bring to you. Our lives, our families, our possessions, and all our praise we gladly bring unto you, for you alone are worthy. So, Almighty God, we worship you now through Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. And amen. 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 The sermon text today is taken from Exodus chapter 18. Exodus 18, beginning at verse 13, these are the words of God. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood by Moses from the morning unto the evening. And when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did to the people, he said, what is this thing that thou doest to the people? Why sittest thou thyself alone, and all the people stand by thee from morning unto even? And Moses said unto his father-in-law, Because the people come unto me to inquire of God. When they have a matter, they come unto me, and I judge between one and another, and I do make them known and know the statutes of God and his laws. And Moses' father-in-law said unto him, The thing that thou doest is not good. Thou wilt surely wear away, both thou and this people that is with thee. For this thing is too heavy for thee, and thou art not able to perform it thyself alone." Hearken now unto my voice, I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. Be thou for the people to Godward, thou mayest bring the causes unto God. And thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws, and shalt show them the way wherein they must walk, and the work that they must do. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties and rulers of tens. And let them judge the people at all seasons, and it should be that every great matter they shall bring unto thee, but every small matter they shall judge. So shall it be easier for thyself, and they shall bear the burden with thee. And if thou shalt do this thing, and God command thee so, then thou shalt be able to endure, and all this people shall also go to their place in peace." So Moses hearkened to the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he had said. And Moses chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads over the people, rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. And they judged the people at all seasons. The hard causes they brought unto Moses, but every small matter they judged themselves. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank you that you have invited us here that you are here in our midst. Father, we thank you for your word and we surrender ourselves to it now. Father, we ask you to pour out your spirit upon us so that we might rightly understand it, so that we might rightly apply it and we might go from this place equipped to obey you and with your blessing on our heads. We ask for this in Jesus' name, amen. Modern people expect solutions. We have cold pizza and we want it warm now. And so we put it in the microwave. We want solutions. You have a headache and you take ibuprofen because it needs to go away now. You have decided. Modern people are people who expect 
solutions, and maybe if you don't have a solution right away, we will settle for progress, which of course is understood as a step towards the solution. The solution is in sight. The solution uh, is at hand. We just need to put a couple more things together and then we'll have it. And we call that progress because we insist on solutions. If we're not careful, when people become Christians and come into the church, they can track in various assumptions about solutions and progress into the church with them. Maybe this is sort of like people from California moving to Idaho. I don't know, something like that. Um, when it comes to problems and challenges we face, people and churches tend to veer in one of two directions in order to accomplish said solutions. We, we tend to veer in a couple of different directions. One of them is we, we tend to veer in one direction that says what we need around here is more organization. We need more structure around here. And you know, think about this at all different levels. So your family, at work, in the church, the neighborhood, the community, all, all those different levels, kind of keep that all in mind. But some people, we, we veer in the direction of what we need is more organization. This is just too sloppy, it's too freewheeling, we need a meeting, we need a schedule, we need a plan, we need a committee, we need more leaders, we need organization, we need a structure. And then a bunch of other people in the world veer the other direction. We say, the thing that's causing all this problem is there's too much structure. You're trying to over-engineer everything. You over-plan everything, and it's just not working. We, need, we, need, we just need to just be personal. We just need to do life. We just need to, we, we just, it's just the spirit moving, and you just got to kind of feel it as you go. Because all these structures and committees are getting in the way. Which one are you? You know which one you are? Are you the guy, are you the one that says, we need more structure or get rid of this plan? You say, which day of the week? Maybe, right? Maybe, a lot of us are ping pong balls. What we need is a plan. I hate that plan. <laughs> just schizophrenic. We're just bouncing back and forth. We, we, we need a reading schedule. No, no, that didn't work. I hate reading schedules. We, we need this. No, we don't. And we, and we ping pong, maybe depending on the day of the week. Some people bring a similar kind of attention to their, to their reading of the Bible. And they see in the Bible maybe even uh, this grid of sorts. Maybe some see the Old Testament as highly regulated. That was God's administrative state. But in the New Testament, it's now the, the era of the spirit. And we're free of organization and hierarchy. Or maybe some people flip it and say, actually, the Old Testament was the free-flowing age. I mean, miracles and visions and, you know, the Bible, you know, who knew what the Bible was? They were still putting it together, free-flowing. Now, here in the New Testament age, we finally settled down with elders and deacons and a closed canon. But I think both of these extremes, whether our personality tendencies and traits and temptations or uh, our ways of reading the Bible are, are wrong. What we see in the Bible is actually that there's great continuity in how God instructs us to face challenges and problems that need solutions. The Bible gives us a great deal of continuity. It gives us instruction that, 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 is, that has a great deal of continuity with regard to how we ought to organize ourselves and how we ought to bear one another's burdens in this life. And what we find if we study the scriptures carefully is that there is real help for our troubles. There's real help for our challenges in the way that God instructs us to organize our community life together. There's real help there. There's real accountability there. But what we find, though, is that God's overarching concern is to teach us to look to him. And, and there's a way of looking to Christian community. There's a way of looking to structures in Christian community that ignores him, forgets him, 
and then creates, I think, sort of a, a looping mechanism in our lives where we're saying, let's try the structure. The structure didn't work. Throw the structure away. And then we do it on repeat. Because the missing element is that God would have us, as we submit to his order, as we submit to the structures that he would have us submit to in our families and in our businesses and in, our, in the public square and in the church, he would have us overarchingly, centrally looking to him. He would have us look to him. The point of the structure, the point of the organization, the point of these governmental structures is ultimately calling us to look to Christ. So most Christians are familiar with the exhortation from Galatians 6, bear one another's burdens. I think frequently as it's used sort of in, in a popular way, uh, people assume that this merely means that we should have Christian friends that we can share our struggles and hardships with. Bear one of those burdens, right? That means have a friend that you can tell anything. I think that's popularly what we think. Now, I, of course, believe with the Bible that Christian friendship is important. But what Paul is urging us to there in Galatians 6, 2, to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ it is in a broader biblical context, and it actually means a lot more than that. It means a lot more than that, and it's a great blessing if we can see that. Paul's actually exhorting Christians to, to remember the fullness of what God has given us in his word, that he, he's told us quite a bit about actually what it looks like to bear one another's burdens, and it's, and it's not just this some kind of random, free-flowing, doing life together thing, but is rather a lot more like a vast army with a continuum of organization and authority with every soldier doing their part. You think about a huge army, I mean, is, there, is, it, is it organized or is it free-flowing? Well, obviously, in many ways, it's highly organized and highly regimented. But in the, in the moment of battle, in the day of battle, that organization is, if you just sort of are following rules in the middle of the battle, you're, you'll be a terrible soldier. The rules in the organization give you certain patterns to follow, certain instincts that need to happen. But in the day of battle, every soldier has to think. Every soldier must be wise and do their part all the way down to the seemingly most insignificant. And so... I think the picture that emerges from the Bible on, you know, so how do, are we to organize ourselves? How are we to bear one another's burdens? Is something more like a great army. And ultimately, the way God teaches us to organize our families and our lives and our churches and our society, is ult its ultimate goal is teaching us to look to him. And, I, and, and we see this pattern going all the way back to the story of Jethro, giving these instructions to Moses in Exodus 18. How many of you read Exodus 18 yesterday? I see a few hands. Actually, I think there are more hands in the second service than the first service. So, you know, good job. If you're following the Bible reading challenge, some of you are like, I don't know what you're talking about. The Bible reading challenge had us read Exodus 18 yesterday, and uh, that may or may not have been a coincidence. But uh, that's where we want to start. So let's work through this text together. At the time of the Exodus, Israel was com comprised of around 600,000 fighting men. That's what Exodus 12, 37 tells us, as well as Exodus 38, 26. Uh, so we can reasonably estimate that the total number of Israelites was in the millions. Uh, we know that there would have been women, there would have been the elderly, there would have been children, and we're also told as the people of Israel are going out of the land that a great mixed multitude went up with them, uh, meaning that a bunch of the Egyptians got the memo, right? I mean, a bunch of the Egyptians were like, we're going with that God, right? Our gods are nothing, that God wins, we're going with them. So millions of Israelites plus a bunch of other people that said we're going with you it's a big city. 
Our text picks up a couple of months after the Exodus when Jethro comes with Zipporah and Moses, uh, two sons, to meet Moses near Mount Sinai. See this in 18 verse 5. Then after catching up and worshiping God together, verses 7 through 12, Jethro watches Moses judging the people all day long. See that in verses 13 to 16. Uh, Jethro echoes God's assessment of Adam being alone and says, this is not good. This is not good. And says it's too heavy a burden for Moses to carry by himself. Verses 17 and 18. So Jethro counsels Moses to teach the laws of God to the people. See this in verses 19 and 20. So don't just teach them when they come to you. Because he says, when they come to me, I explain the laws to them. And he says, you need to just teach them all the laws of God. You need to have the laws of God just going out. Okay, that's the first bit of counsel he gives them. And then he says, you also need to establish another, a, a tiered system of judges. Judges, these are men who, will, who fear God, who love the truth, who hate covetousness. And you need to set them over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. See that in verse 21. These men will judge the smaller cases, and then the heavier ones can be appealed up to the higher courts, and the hardest cases of all can come before Moses, in order that Moses may be more efficient with his time, and notice that Jethro says, so that, the, so that Israel may have peace. This is not just so that Moses will live a longer life, it's also so that Israel might have peace, so that they might not be uh, frustrated or uh, despair of getting justice because the, long so, the line is so long to see Moses. Moses, we're told, obeys his father-in-law and establishes this structure of judges in Israel. You see that in verses 24 to 26. Now, remember that right before this meeting with Jethro was the battle with the Amalekites. Remember in, in chapter seven, or 17, right before this, was the battle with the Amalekites. And, and remember how uh, as they go into battle, God sends them into battle and tells Moses to go up onto the mountain and to lift his hands as Israel is fighting the battle. And, and as the story goes, remember Moses, as he lifted his hands, Israel prevailed in the battle. But then as the battle grow, goes on during the day, his arms get tired and they begin to sink. And as his hands go down, the Amalekites begin to prevail and Israel begins to lose. See this in Exodus 17 verse 11. So Moses is seated on a rock on the mountainside, and Aaron and her, his assistants, stand on either side of him, and they hold up his hands until Israel wins the battle. You see that in verses 12 and 13. And they called the name of that place, the Lord is my banner. The Lord is my banner. Just notice there in that story alone, the kind of support that the Lord loves to give is the kind that causes people to praise and acknowledge him. Well, just from that story alone, what kind of support does God love to give? How does God love our burdens to be borne? He loves the kind of support that causes people to say, the Lord is my banner. The kind of support that causes his people to praise his name. That's the overarching goal of God's people bearing one another's burdens. It's going to come like that. It's going to cause his people to praise and acknowledge him. It's going to cause the nations to praise and acknowledge him. This theme, though, of support and bearing burdens that starts in chapter 17 is what flows right into 18. And so it's not, an, it's not an accident at all that you have two stories back to back where Moses needs help. Chapter 17, chapter 18. And, and this is underlined uh, particularly uh, by the word heavy. In chapter 17, his hands become heavy and he needs help 
burying them, lifting them up. And in 18, verse 18, this is exactly what Jethro says. Thou wilt surely wear away, both thou and this people that is with thee, for this thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. And so then the assistance of the judges is also described by Jethro as bearing the burden with Moses. You see that in verse 22. Let them judge the people at all seasons, and it shall be that every great matter they shall bring unto thee, but every small matter they shall judge. So shall it be easier for thyself, and they shall bear the burden with thee. So here in these two chapters, you have back-to-back stories, though, illustrating the need for these burdens to be shared, the heaviness, the weight of a a, a nation as large as Israel, the weight of the burdens that are borne by a community of people. Centering here on Moses and the need for it to be shared. Some Jewish commentators have estimated taking the numbers very literally, that when he was finished, Moses would have appointed 78,600 judges. Which means he would have had a real leadership training program going on there. But you you think, you know, millions of people, and do the math, thousands, hundreds, fifties, tens, 78, over 78,000 judges needed to be installed to follow these instructions. But the principle that I I want to press upon us is that it's being given here by Jethro to Moses is is a principle of decentralization and localism. Decentralization and localism. This is the biblical principle that's given here by Jethro to Moses and we see coming back throughout the Bible, as we'll see in a minute, which basically means we are, as Christians, to address problems at the smallest, most personal level first, and then we are to appeal the, most, the more difficult problems to higher courts as necessary. That's the basic principle of biblical justice, of handling problems and disputes, of seeking solutions to our problems. We start with the lowest most local, most personal level first, and then we appeal problems as needed to higher courts. This is one of the biblical principles built into our civil governments and courts. We have various levels of government, city, county, state, and so on. We have local uh, courts. We have uh, circuit courts. We have supreme courts. This is also uh, bound up in the whole theory of separation of powers, uh, this, that's, a, that's an application of this principle, uh, that it's decentralized, and so there's a separation of powers. Also, the idea of sphere sovereignty, that there are different tasks given to different authorities. The family and the church are given jurisdictions over particular things, and the state, or the civil magistrate, is given jurisdiction over certain things. These are uh, extensions of this basic principle. In the review of this institution in Deuteronomy, Moses says that these officers were appointed also by the people. So in Deuteronomy, remember Deuteronomy is the book where Moses is reviewing everything before they go into the land. And in the very first chapter, he actually reviews Exodus 18. He says, remember when we established our form of government? And he says this, I told you then, Take you, wise men, and understanding, known among your tribes, and I will make them rulers over you. Deuteronomy 1.13. So clearly, there was collaboration between the established authorities, Moses at the time, and the people, indicating that there was to be accountability in both directions. So the leaders have a certain amount of accountability of who is getting appointed, and the people are nominating leaders, saying, this guy, he fears God. He hates covetousness. He loves justice. He would make a great leader. He would great, make a great judge. And so there's accountability in both directions, checks and balances in both directions, as the people were the ones that um, nominated the judges that Moses then installed. We see the same process echoed and repeated in the New Testament with the appointment of elders and deacons. A very similar 
principle is at work as uh, the apostles begin to raise up leaders and leave other leaders in place to appoint elders. So in Titus chapter 1, uh, Paul says, Titus, I left you there in Crete so that you would uh, ordain elders in every city. So every city needs elders and then gives them a list of qualifications. These are godly men. They have reputations of holiness and godliness. Their households and, and their, um, their businesses are, are, um, are uh, ones where people would say, that's a, that's a godly man. He's got a good reputation. He's, he's run his household well. He can serve in the household of God. The same thing is in 1 Timothy 3 where Paul tells Timothy the same thing with regard to establishing elders there in Ephesus. And we see something similar with the deacons being established in Acts 6. There's a decentralization. The apostles say it would not be good for us to leave the, um, the word of God in prayer to go serve the tables. This is an important job, but someone else needs to do it. Someone else needs to be appointed to this task. And then they tell the people, hey, bring us good men. And so the people come, nominate good men, the apostles, approve them, lay hands on them, and, ins and install them. So we see running from Jethro down to the New Testament with the installation of elders and deacons, this pattern of what we might call the Jethro principle uh, of bearing one another's burdens. What you see here, though, is there is a formal structure. The Bible's not against the formal structures. The Bible's not against these things. We have them going all the way back to the wisdom of Jethro, all the way up to the New Testament. But the Bible adds more. We see this also uh, by analogy, reasoning by analogy, in the instructions of Jesus for dealing with disputes between believers. But notice what he says. First, go and tell your brother his fault between you and him alone, Matthew 18. He doesn't say, if your brother snubs you, call the cops. He doesn't say, if your brother snubs you, call an elder. He doesn't say, if your sister snubs you, post it on Facebook. Right? Just want everybody to know, Sister Susie cut me off today in the Logos parking lot. Just be aware of that. Would you pray for her? No, it's not what it says, right? No, first you go to him or her alone. Completely decentralized, completely localized, right? You can't get more local than that. You and them alone in the room together, or as close to that as you can. Maybe it's a phone call, but as, much, as local as possible. You and them alone, decentralized, local. You only involve another individual as part of the solution, right? Two or three witnesses. You know, the witnesses are the ones that saw her, you know, screaming at you while she pulled around you or whatever, and yeah, sister, what, you know, what's going on? How, how, what, what happened? Maybe they're witnesses who saw the incident. They might also be witnesses, if, if, there, if there weren't witnesses of the event, you might bring someone else in who can then help adjudicate between the dispute. You know, she claims, I was, you know, serene as a rainbow as I exited Logos. I don't know what you're talking about, right? And, and there, now you have this contradiction of, of stories, and you say, well, I... I'm sure it was like this. and So you bring one or two people along with you as witnesses to adjudicate between the dispute. If it is that significant, if that's necessary. And they may, they're there for accountability and they're there to help solve the problem. And they, they, might, they might say, you know what, brother or sister, you, you, just let it go. It's not a big deal. Or they might actually say, no, actually, we, yeah, there's a pattern here. Or we, we see that um, maybe it comes out that there's, there's trouble. There's something that needs to be addressed. But they function then, again, as witnesses to see if they can be solved at that lowest level with just two or three people. But they're, they're brought in to be part of the solution. They're brought in to help solve the problem. Finally, Jesus says, if it can't be solved there, if it's proven that this person is, uh, you know, is, is, is disobedient, is in high-ended sin, and is not repenting, then it should be brought before the church, and the church should rule on it. The church should consider the evidence and the testimony and make a ruling, and if it is in fact demonstrated to be true that this person is in sin and is not walking with Christ, then they can be put outside of the church if they are unrepentant in that situation. But again, notice that 
starting at the most local, working your way up as needed. Paul likewise insists that the Corinthians should practice biblical church government and church discipline for unrepentant sinners. Matthew, in, in 1 Corinthians 5, they've got a guy in the church who's apparently uh, sleeping with his stepmom and is uh, flagrant and proud of it. And the Corinthians thought that they were being very loving and welcoming by letting him continue to be in their fellowship. And Paul says, no, he's in high-handed sin. Confront him, and, he, and if he's not going to repent, he needs to be put out. Hand him over to Satan, 1 Corinthians 5 says. You need to judge. You need to judge this situation rightly, and you need to uh, purify the church of God. Remember, a little bit of leaven leavens the whole loaf. But he also goes on in the very next chapter, interestingly, um, saying, but, but you guys failed at this. The reason why you can't put this guy out of your church rightly, the reason why you're not judging rightly in church matters is because you all have been fighting and taking various lawsuits to unbelievers outside the church. You, you haven't been practicing faithful judgment in the church. He says, isn't there a wise person among you who can dis decide between these disputes? Why are you taking your disputes to unbelievers outside? This is a shame. He says, you're, Christians are going to judge the world. Christians are going to judge angels. Christians, you need to solve these problems in-house. You need to solve these problems yourself. Otherwise, you're causing great shame to come on the church. And, of course, we still have this problem today. You know, no wonder the world says, well, yeah, Christianity is a nice, you know, a religious box to check. But, but what happens? We bring our disputes from the church into, the, into unbelieving law courts, and they see us coming in and like, yeah, yeah, looks like you guys are doing great in there, right? Looks like you guys are handling your problems great. All your dirty laundry ends up in our civil courts. Now, I know there's exceptions to that. And, and sometimes it's glorious exceptions. Sometimes the, the civil magistrates see how Christians handle problems and solve problems well. And it's a, it's a huge stark contrast with the way unbelievers do. And praise God for those instances. But Paul says, you should rather be defrauded by your brother, rather get ripped off, than end up in court with your brother. And none, and none of this set, sets aside the, the calling of the civil magistrate to adjudicate crimes. But that's still their lawful calling to adjudicate crimes. And so when a crime has been committed, it needs to be submitted to the criminal uh, minister of justice that God has established uh, as much as possible, Romans 13, 4. But when Paul says the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God, but those who have been purchased by the blood of Christ have been washed and justified by Christ and sanctified by his spirit. Paul's not merely talking about the glory of just being washed clean and justified, which is absolutely glorious and wonderful. But in the context, he's talking about the ability then to see clearly, the ability to judge rightly, the ability to apply the law of Christ in community. Right? The, the ground for that is you being washed clean. The, 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 your ability to see clearly is based on the ability to see how clearly, how much you've been washed, how much you've been forgiven. This is what the Spirit is for. And so this brings us full circle back to Galatians 6. This is all just a really long introduction to that, actually. <laughs> Bearing one another's burdens. When Paul says, so bear one another's burdens... There's a whole bunch of background here. That's not just a, a throwaway, hey, you know, just make sure you have close friends and you tell them all your problems. No, Galatians 6, 1 is right before Galatians 6, 2. And it says, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. But first off, don't miss the fact that part of what it means to be spiritual was just explained a couple verses before in the fruits of the Spirit, which comes just at the end of Galatians 5. 
So you who are spiritual means people who have the fruit of the Spirit growing in them. These are not like super uber Christians. These are not, these are not people who are only pastors or bishops or something fancy. It's people who have the fruit of the Spirit in the first instance. Also, remember that the Spirit is the one that gives gifts to the body. The Spirit is the one who gives gifts of evangelism and missions and pastoring and administration and hospitality. That's what the Spirit's also doing. So being spiritual means being put in the place where you're gifted, where God's called you and accepting that responsibility and bearing it wisely. Of course, being spiritual also means here, you know, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Think of Jesus' words of, before you go talk to your brother about the speck in his eye, have you removed the log in your own eye? Have you begun by considering yourself? Have you begun by seeing if you're a contributor to the problem? Do you have something to confess? Are you seeing this matter clearly? Assume, Jesus says, that you aren't. Begin by assuming there's probably something distorted in the way I'm seeing this. Remove the log out of your own eye first. But then it doesn't say, since you have logs in your eye, you better not talk to anybody. No, that's, what, that's not what Jesus says. He says, remove the log out of your eye so that you will see clearly in order to remove the speck in your brother's eye, so that you will be able to restore a brother overtaken in a fault. In other words, the fruit of the Spirit, the gift of the Spirit, is for making godly judgments. And in making godly judgments in what, wherever the sphere of authority is that God has placed us, that is actually how we bear one another's burdens and fulfill the law of Christ. If we're reading the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and we hear Paul say, bearing one another's burdens, you ought to be thinking, that means we need elders and we need deacons and we need judges. But it doesn't stop there. It's also those who, you know, you have a sphere of authority in your home. If you're a father, you're a mother. You who are spiritual, you need to get spiritual there so that you can address the people who are being overtaken in faults in the other room. You who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness. We are given the spirit so that we can make godly judgments in our spheres of authority, so that we can receive godly judgments and submit to godly authority. All of this is how we bear one another's burdens and fulfill the law of Christ. And this includes the, the Moses requirement that we not then respect persons, that we not fear the face of man, that we actually practice justice, that we not fear man, but we fear God. And, and again, back to Paul's point in Corinthians, if we're not practicing this at the lowest levels, we're not gonna be ready for it when we have a business or when we are an elder or a deacon or when you're on the, civil, the some, uh, city council or appointed to some kind of public service. So parents, you practice this in your home. You practice due diligence and due process and justice in your home. I mean, if, if Jimmy walks in with a baseball bat and there's a broken lamp in the other room, how do you walk through that? Do you say, well, I know you did it. Come with me. Well, was there witnesses? Was there testimony? Was little Bobby in there with little Jimmy? I'm going to mess up these names in a second, I know. Right? What, did you hear a sound? When did it happen? Were there any, is there testimony? Is there witnesses? Is there evidence? You have to walk through due process. You say, well, I just know it was Jimmy. He's got the baseball bat, smoking gun. Well, okay. But is he guilty of first degree or fourth degree? You say, what? Well, did he mean to? Would he sit there with a big grin on his face and say, I'm going to smash mom's vase? Okay, that's first degree. Premeditated, right? Smash, okay? Well, then you need to find evidence, though, that can convict him of that. Now, if he says it, there you go. You got a confession. Right? He says, I did it. Yep, hated that vase, wanted to smash it. <laughs> All right, Jimmy, right? But is it possible that he was in there just, you know, getting ready? You know, getting ready for the big game? He's three years old. I mean, he's just, you know, swings as hard as he can and just running and doesn't know what happened. And you say, did you break mom's vase? And he doesn't have any clue. 
Is that possible? Yeah, I'd say it's possible, right? It was accidental, inadvertent. Did he smash it? Yeah, he smashed it. But that's a different conviction, isn't it? And so, but practicing that, you say, well, that's all right, okay. But the point of that is we practice that because why? Because we're going to judge angels. We practice that because we want to be able to bear one another's burdens rightly. So when there's a report of something to you, what do you do with that? You don't just say, oh, man, that's horrible. She did what? Yeah, I'm not going to, whoa, why? I'm going to pray for her a lot. Right. No, no you're, you're, not, you're not judging the situation rightly. You're not being judicious. You're not practicing due diligence and due process of the law. And so this has very, very practical ramifications. This is how we bear one another's burdens. Yes, of course, it often is at one-on-one level, face-to-face, in friendships. And there, it's most tempting sometimes to let those principles of justice fall away, to begin to respect persons, to fear the faces of people rather than being true friends who don't care, who don't practice justice with partiality. Well, they're my old friend. They're my sister. They're my brother-in-law. They're, you know, It also says here that we need to restore our brother in a spirit of meekness. And I just don't think that's an accident at all because that very word, meek, was the the same word used to describe Moses in Numbers 12.3. If you remember, Moses was the meekest man on the earth, according to Numbers 12.3. I think if you wanted to, you could paraphrase Paul and say, uh, brethren, if any man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of Moses. In the spirit of Moses. You say, well, that kind of sounds mean. <laughs> it's because you're not reading the Bible right. In the spirit of Moses, who is the meekest man in the earth. What's the spirit of Moses? What's that meekness that Moses had? Well, we're told actually just in the chapter before in Numbers chapter 11, this is another situation where where Moses was facing another one of Israel's great complaining moments, one of their big fits, crying out to Moses, why did you bring us out here? Why do we have to die here? And And Moses turns to God and says, I am not able to bear all this people alone because it's too heavy for me. Numbers 11, 14. Notice that word heavy again. And and the response of God is, gather unto me 70 men of the elders of Israel, and I will take of the spirit which is upon thee, and I will put it on them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with thee. Notice Moses has a spirit, the spirit of Moses, the spirit of meekness. And God says what needs to happen is, it's not just enough to have the organization in place. Right? He's taking 70 Men, apparently, from these officers or judges, or maybe there's 70 more. And he says what they need is the spirit. It's not just enough to have the structure. You also need the spirit. It's not enough merely to have the structure in place that God says to do, but you have to look to God for the blessing on it. So bearing one another's burdens means applying the law of Christ with wisdom to the situations around you and receiving that with humility and meekness, gladly working within the biblical structures that God has established. Whose jurisdiction is this? Is this a place where the parents need to be involved? Is this a place where an elder needs to be involved? Is this a place where a police officer needs to be involved? Is this a place where the boss needs to be involved or the, or the administrator of the school needs to be involved? That's what biblical wisdom is all about. You can't do it rightly unless you have the spirit of God. It's not enough to merely have the structures in place. You need to have the spirit of God upon you. You won't do it rightly unless you are spiritual. And you cannot have the spirit of God unless you are seeking God with all that you are. Unless you've been adopted into God's family by faith in the son of God. And now that's all your glory. So it's, so it's not like Paul was saying that spiritual people can restore brothers overtaken in fault, but the rest of us just bear one another's burdens. Do, do you see that? It's, it's not like bearing one another's burdens is an option for non-spiritual people. Right? Well, I'm not the spiritual one, so I just bear people's burdens. No, it all goes together. You can't bear one another's burdens unless you're a spiritual person. 
Whatever it is that you're trying to do, apart from the Spirit of God's, not going to help. It's going to make it worse. It's, it's, not, it's not enough to say, well, I mean well. I'm, I'm helping, I think. No, you need the Spirit of God. You need the wisdom of Christ, and you need to apply the law of Christ to it. How do I handle this report? How do I handle this situation? Whose jurisdiction is this? Maybe you need to go to him. Maybe it's a one-on-one -on -one thing. Maybe you need to involve another person. Maybe it needs to be appealed, and that takes wisdom. But bearing one another's burdens is not just listening to other people's problems. In fact, unless you are part of the solution, you may merely be making things worse. We've been inundated with the, the false gospel of sharing. You know the false gospel of sharing? This is the, the false gospel that says, if you just share it, everything will be better. Just get it off your chest. Just be transparent. What we need is more transparency. Just share whatever's on your mind. And it'll make everything better, right? Which at best is just Freudian, at best. And nobody wants to be Freudian. No, it's pagan. It's a false gospel. Right? There, there's no automatic promise Right? God does, the Bible does not teach that there's any automatic blessing in merely sharing. No, you, you need to share particular information with the right people to get the right solution. That's what the Bible says. And some things you should not share. <laughs> but I really need to. No, you don't. <laughs> Faithful are the wounds of godly friends. Sometimes they, you need to say something hard, difficult, to someone close to you. Faithful are the wounds of godly friends, but the kisses of enemies are deceitful. Flattery works ruin. How often do we listen to things and then we just flatter? There's, oh, yeah. We're not part of the solution. Where there is no tailbearer, strife ceases. Right? Imagine that. People stop sharing and strife goes away. Trouble evaporates. And of course, a faithful spirit covers many sins in love. So the Jethro principle is applied as God pours out his spirit upon all flesh and establishes various leaders and various spheres of authority who apply the word of Christ faithfully and causes his people to receive that teaching and that instruction, those judgments with peace and gratitude. And there is accountability both ways. Just because someone's the leader doesn't mean they always get it right. That's the why there's the people, the accountability with people and the accountability with other leaders but this is what it means to bear one another's burdens. But God is determined to build his church in such a way as to cause his people and all the ends of the earth to look to him. You see, I think sometimes we, we all want the solution to be in the structure or the plan. And God does give structure, and God does give a plan. Yes, you need elders in every city, and you need deacons, and you need pastors, and you need parents, and you need husbands and wives, and you need teachers, and you need bosses and employers and employees, and you need city councils and, and county judges. You need all those things in place. But the thing is, is none of those things are the solution. And, and if we're not careful, we look to those things, and we think, if we just get this thing right then it'll solve the problem. But God is determined and he's, he's ordered the world in such a way that yes, he gives us those forms, but the forms are supposed to make us look to him, not the forms. And so this is why you can get you know, the book, the parenting, you know, the, you know, parenting for Dummies. And here it is, and you follow it all, or marriage for you know, and okay, husband, and that's what the wife does, and you're doing it, and you're doing it, and you're doing it, and no one's happy, no one likes each other, and it's getting worse. Why? Because it could be all day long biblical principles and you're looking in the wrong place. It's not merely that we obey God. You obey God and then you look to him for the blessing. 
You obey God and then you look to him for the blessing. Because otherwise, what are we doing? We think we're pretty good at following God's rules. I am pretty smart. I'm a pretty good mom. Figured out who hit the face. I'm a pretty good teacher. I'm pretty, what, what is that? Well, God is determined to save the world in such a way that when it's all said and done, nobody has a foot to stand on. He's determined to save the whole, whole world in such a way that every mouth is shut and everybody says, the Lord is our banner. We didn't do this. It's, it's an awful lot more like watching Moses on the mountain with his hands in the air. I mean, how do you win battles like that, right? Which biblical strategy, I mean, a warfare strategy book is that in? Have your general on the hill with his arms up, and if he gets tired, hold him up for him. It'll work. No. Why? Because it's God's blessing. That's the point. It's God's blessing. You can have all the right structures and all there is in place, and if God's not blessing, it doesn't matter. Why? Because what we'll do is we'll take what God said to do, and then we'll claim credit for it. I'm a good husband, I'm a good wife, I'm a good parent, I'm a good pastor, I'm a good elder, I'm a good boss. Look at me go. And God says, no, you're still not getting it. The point of it is all, of all is that we would do it God's way, but then we would look to him and say, God, if you don't bless this, it won't work. If you don't make this work, it won't go. There's a way of idolizing the methods, the solution, the progress, the system, the community, the leader that God will not bless. He wants us to obey him and look to him. So what's our hope in all this? Christ sits in heaven with his pierced hands raised for us. And he never grows tired. He never grows weary. And he cares for us. We look to him. We thank him for the structures. We thank him for parents. We thank him for husbands. We thank him for pastors. We thank him for all the gifts. But at the end of the day, all of it is meant to point to Christ. If you're looking to these things, the methods, the people, the faces, the principles, you're going to be disappointed, however good they are. But Christ is seated in heaven, ever interceding for us. We can always cast our cares upon him because he cares for us. And because his hands are lifted for us, we will win the battle. Father and God, we praise you and we thank you for Jesus who died and rose again to win all the battles to save this world. Father, we thank you that you have determined to save this world, to fix all our problems and to make all things right in such a way as to shut all our mouths. Father, we thank you for this. We thank you that you will not use human wisdom, but you are determined to do it in such a way that every one of us will look at each other and say, this was God. This was Jesus. He saved our marriage. He saved our kids. He saved us and this whole world. And glory to God. Father, we praise you and we thank you for this. In Jesus' name who taught us to pray, singing. Our God is a warrior. When the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt, the Lord went to battle against his and their enemies. Uh, the ten plagues are ordered in such a way as to demonstrate that the God of the Hebrews was more powerful than any and all of the Egyptians' most re revered gods. Their gods could not keep what God had determined to deliver each battle shows that what the Egyptians worshipped as a deity was, in fact, no god at all. The god of the Nile, defeated. The goddess of fertility, uh, represented as a woman with a frog's head, nonetheless, defeated. The god of earth and the goddess of the sky, defeated. And so on, until utter darkness descended on Egypt for three days, mocking their second highest god, Ra. The Lord embarrassed all their idols. He turned what they had honored as deities into the very things that brought ruination upon their land. God went to battle against his enemies and wiped the floor with them. This contest wasn't even close. The final battle, the tenth plague, takes aim at Pharaoh himself. He was the embodiment of the Egyptians' entire religious system. He was the highest of the gods. For this final showdown, the Lord commands his people to hold a feast.
while he brings their captor to to utter ruin. All this should assure us of a glorious truth. God fights for us. Our enemies are defeated. Sin, the devil, the world, defeated. But they are not defeated by you or me. We feast while he fights. He conquers for us while we enjoy the peace he wins for us. He delivers us while we partake of the bread of his body and the wine of his blood. We remember in this meal that God delivers his people in order to commune with his people. This is a victory feast where we taste the spoils of the great war our king has won. So come in faith and welcome to Jesus. Father, we thank you that you've delivered us from all our enemies. You've set this table before us. You've provided for us a lamb that we might be delivered from all of our sins, from the devil, from the world. And so we give thanks for this meal, for this bread, for this wine. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. For I received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. 